It's a nice day today. Travel. A dirty word at the moment, right? Because none of us can travel. You can't travel. I can't travel. I'm living in Minsk, Belarus for the foreseeable future. And all of us have been affected by this outbreak, including those in the travel industry, including travel YouTubers who have YouTube as their primary income. I'm very lucky and very fortunate that I have other incomes to sustain myself. And in terms of Belarus, there are minimal restrictions. I can enter the country, I can exit the country, I can walk around, I don't have to be in quarantine, I don't have to be in self-isolation. And the thing I'm very conscious of is that many of you are in that position. Many of you are in a very despondent state, a very depressed state. And one thing I don't want to do is to be seen to be sauntering around a city as if nothing is wrong filming travel videos. On the flip side, two things are very important, hope and normality. I think if I was in self-quarantine, self-isolation, I would want to see a bit of normality. I would want to see a bit of hope that one day we will be able to taste that amazing street food, that one day we'll be able to swim in the oceans again, and one day we'll be able to climb those mountains again. So today, I'm going out to film a video. Let's go. It's so much harder now to reach you. is out of control. Brilliant. Privyet, Stolast would say Dobry Utro. Welcome to Minsk, Belarus. Or in English, White Russia, or in German, Weiss Russland. Yes, lovely. And one of the things I'm asked quite frequently about Belarus is where is Belarus? So Belarus is a former Soviet country in between Poland and Russia. It also borders other countries like Lithuania. It actually used to be part of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And I'm in one of the many large squares. I'm quite fortunate, again, to have been to many countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. So this square reminds me very much of squares in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. And you've got such wonderful architecture around me. Look, such a variety of architecture, which we're going to be checking out in this video and subsequent videos. Behind me, you'll see the red and green and that pattern, that's the Belarus flag. The pattern part is a decorative pattern that's often seen on fabrics, not only in Belarus, but also in other Slavic countries. It's called a Rushnik, hope I got that correct. And it means various things. It's quite a bit of a mystery in terms of um, when I was researching, but I'm sure you can fill me in in the comments if you know more. Now to start off with, let's eliminate a couple of misconceptions about Belarus. Belarus is grey and boring. No, it is not. Yes, it was largely destroyed in the Second World War, so most of the architecture is Soviet style from the 50s and beyond. However, as you can see, it's not grey and boring. It's different colours, it's different styles. Fascinating. And another thing to highlight is that Belarus is not Russia which seems to be a huge misconception, just because mainly people speak Russian, yes, people speak Belarusian as well, and it used to be part of the Soviet Union, doesn't mean that it doesn't have its own identity, which it does, which I've already discovered in the last week, particularly in terms of food. And interestingly, I feel like I've already got a couple of connections with Belarus. As you know, I'm an online English teacher and the vast majority of my students are from Russian-speaking countries, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine. So it's great to finally be able to learn some basic Russian and use it on a daily basis. Belarusian I find slightly more difficult and most people speak Russian anyway. So, Stavrasvudse, hello, formal, good day. My pronunciation is awful, but at least I'm trying. The second thing is that I'm half Polish and I'm already noticing that there are some similarities between Belarusian and Polish food, which I'm looking forward to exploring in future videos. I spy with my little eyes, something beginning with M. Mashrutka. At least. I think that's what they're called. Um, I remember in Kyrgyzstan, um, I used to get a lot of these, basically like a minibus Mercedes Sprinter with a sign in the window in Cyrillic telling you where to go. If you get one from the airport, the airport bus, it is a mashutka. They're a really cool way of traveling around, I must say, in these sort of countries. It is.
is a lovely day today. And one thing about Minsk that you'll notice, there are so many lovely parks with monuments like that and wonderful architecture around the side. The thing I will say is this is very much a first impressions video. So more than likely I will be in Minsk for the foreseeable future for a few months. The government has increased the visa free length from 30 days, the duration to 90 days. So that's great. So I want to go into more detail in other videos. And um, we've got a bit of walking to do in this video because I'm avoiding public transport, you know, social distancing and everything, which actually is quite easy. Because as you can see, it's Sunday afternoon. It's quite deserted at the moment. Behind me is the National Bolshoi Opera and Ballet Theatre. Impressive building huge absolutely huge i would love to go and see the opera maybe even some ballet but obviously given the current climate being around people would probably not be a good idea and obviously when we hear the word bolshoi it's very famous in terms of russian ballet things like that so um i've seen pictures inside it's beautiful like red and colorful i might put some pictures over the top of this bit just to show what it looks like in a time where there isn't a pandemic beautiful and it even looks on the top um, around the other side. It even looks like slightly Art Deco with the buildings. I'll have to check when it was built. Hang on, 1939. That ties in with my Art Deco idea. <laughs> yeah, Art Deco, early 30s. I've now walked down to Victory Square. Just look at those buildings with the Cyrillic lettering on the top. I love that. I'm such a geek when it comes to architecture and alphabets and lettering. But anyway, the Victory Monument is to commemorate the end of the Second World War. As in many countries, there are monuments like this. Um, obviously, I can't get close to it because, as you can see, there is construction going on. But um, it's a nice place to come to, you know, think about the history. There's a Mashutka coming right at me. Brilliant. And, you know, if you haven't been to an ex-Soviet country before and seen architecture like this with the lettering over the buildings, it's, it's awesome. I'm just off Victory Square now and there's something just around the corner that is actually shocking. I didn't know about this. My grasp of American history isn't that great, so probably for many of you watching from the States, you'll know about this. So just around the corner is the former home of Lee Harvey, Os Lee Harvey Oswald, the guy that, in quote marks, allegedly assassinated John F. Kennedy in Dallas. Apparently he defected to the Soviet Union after that happened and he lived just around the corner. Um, I understand that you can't actually go in, so it's not like the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas where there's like a tour or anything. It's just a house, but you know, it's still a cool historical thing to come and see. Okay, as expected, it's a bit of an anticlimax. <laughs> because it's just an apartment building nowadays where people live in, so you know, you can't go in. It's not like a museum or a tour or anything. Um, yeah, brilliant. This is, at least this is where Google Maps says it is. This apartment building, in, I've come out into this courtyard area. There's a playground, there's a big tower thingy up there. So yeah, interesting bit of history if that's what you're into. We're gonna get on the subway now. I know what you're gonna say, social distancing. However, the next stop I need to go to, the last place I wanna show you in this video, is five stops away on the metro. It's gonna take ages to walk there. But if it is crowded, I'm gonna get off and walk. But to be honest with you, I don't think it will be that crowded. So um, we'll see. I don't know how to get the metro in Minsk, by the way. No idea. I guess we're gonna find out. <laughs> I don't know which way I need to go. <laughs> so I may look at my map and figure it out, but just look at the um, station. It reminds me a bit like the ones in Kiev um, with the type of, um, what would you say, decoration and obviously Cyrillic. It's beautiful, nice and wide as well, not too busy. Okay, I've just seen that park, the one beginning with C. Um, I think I'm gonna go this way. I've seen it on the map, there we go. Ah! <sighs> 
<laughs> so I'm pretty sure I've come the right direction. Fingers crossed, about 95% sure. Um, you know what, the Belarus, I mean Minsk subway is easy to use once you figure out the Cyrillic and know which direction you're going in. You get a little token thing. I'm gonna put the cost down below, but it's very affordable. In comparison to other countries, it reminded me very much of um, Kiev, as I said. Similar cost as well. Um, so yeah, let's find the last spot. And we're gonna say a very long word. Rombi, oh God, what is it? Oh, Rombi Kuboktahedron, Rombi that's it. You see, I practiced right. <laughs> it's sometime later, and unsurprisingly, the 5% of me that was wrong was actually right. Because I had to get back on the subway again and go back the other way. Anyone from Minsk will know that I was going the wrong way, but I've just discovered that. I make these mistakes, so you do, don't have to. And actually, all the subway stations are numbered, which is really helpful. And you know what? This is what it's about, discovery. I prefer not to um, research stuff before, make mistakes and learn from it, but now I know. Right, where is this Rombi, oh, whatever it's called. Minsk is bonkers. I think that might have to be the title of this video because look at this, you've got the, the classic Soviet style gray concrete architecture with the Rushneks along the top. Over here, you've got modern shopping malls. I guess those are shop, um, apartment buildings. And then wait for it. Look what's right next to me. That is a Rombi cuboctahedron. <laughs> it's a library, people. Let's get some better lighting. So a rhombic cuboctahedron is a geometric shape with a number of square sides and also triangular. I can't remember how many, but it's a really cool piece of architecture in Minsk because it's a real stark contrast compared to the rest of the architecture. And um, it feels a lot bigger than I thought it would be. I've seen photos and it looks quite small and I understand at night it lights up, illuminated and there's a viewing platform as well. We're going to go inside and have a look. Why am I out of breath? Okay, I've been in the library, couldn't film in there, but to be honest with you, it's no great loss. It was just books, um, conference rooms, uh, lots of filing cabinets, laptops, people working. But now we're gonna go up to the observation deck because I found the way up there. Hopefully I don't have to pay or it's not closed. Lovely. Right, observation deck, 23rd floor, brilliant. Oh, light. Okay, fortunately there's a lift. <laughs> I, was, I didn't want to climb up 23 flights. Oh, look at this. Hang on, hang on. Hello, Minsk. Oh my God, I'm a bit scared of heights now. My ears are popping. Oh, there's the Rombi Cuboctahedron. We're right at the top. Amazing. Okay, if you had told me a few weeks ago in Belgrade that in a few weeks I would be on top of a rhombi octahedron in Minsk, I would have sent you to the nearest funny farm. Let's have a look at Minsk. So there is Minsk. Long concrete buildings, curved concrete buildings as well. And this bit particularly uh, reminds me of three years ago I was in Pripyat, the city near Chernobyl in Ukraine. And I was on top of an apartment building and all around me were trees and these type of buildings, these long concrete residential buildings. Um, and then if you look over this side, it's all very modern. So it makes me think, you know, if that Chernobyl incident hadn't happened, would Pripyat look something like Minsk today? Who knows? Probably not, but you've also got those long roads as well, um, which you see in Pripyat. Classic Soviet style city. Right, hello everyone. It's a couple of days later and I'm editing this video as we speak. And I'm also about to make beans on toast for lunch. Yes, Belarus sells beans. Can you believe it? Any Americans watching, you're probably gonna think I'm insane because beans on toast, really? But any English people, you know that beans on toast is life. <coughs> Lovely. And this video wasn't about Minsk. It wasn't about first impressions of Minsk. Yes, that was secondary, but the primary thing is about normality and hope. As I said at the beginning, you may be despondent. You may be staring at your window thinking, I wish I could go out and see the sights. But that's the point. One day you will be able to do that again. And the thing with Minsk is the fact that I didn't really have any preconceptions before I got here, other than the commonly held belief that ex-Soviet countries are grey and miserable and just full of grey concrete buildings. Well, I hope you can see in this video that there is a lot more to Minsk than that preconception. And we're gonna be exploring that more in future videos. And lastly, just take a moment. If you are stuck in your place, staring at a wall going crazy, 
take a look out the window and say to yourself, it's a nice day today.